Okay, welcome everybody to the Ethics in Research and Biotechnology Consortia series. This is a monthly series that brings together leading researchers in science, biotechnology, and medicine, together with bioethicists to talk about not only the science, but also the ethical and social issues that these technologies raise. Uh, my name is Nsiu Hian. I'm your host. I am the Director of Research Ethics for the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School, where I'm also a faculty member. I'm, all, I'm also a professor of bioethics and philosophy at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland. Um, for those of you who have been part of the series for quite some time now, welcome back. For many of the newcomers, welcome for the first time. Many of you have, may have wondered what CAR T cell therapies are. You may have heard about these therapies. Um, and you may have had some questions about how these therapies work and what are some of the ethical issues that they raise. So we're here to answer as many of those questions as possible today. We have a terrific guest uh, to lead you through all this. Our guest today is Dr. Karen Jacobson. She's the medical director of the Immune Effector Cell Therapy Program at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. She's also assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. As a clinician, Dr. Jacobson, treats patients with lymphoma. It's a type of cancer that affects the lymphatic system. And as a scientific researcher, she's an experienced principal investigator on several CAR T cell studies at the Dana-Farber Institute. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it now over to Dr. Jacobson, to Karen. Um, she's gonna lead us through some of the science uh, for about an hour. And here and there, I'll pepper in some questions that I think may be on your minds as you're listening to her presentation. Then the, second, uh, then the second part is the last half hour of today's session from uh, 1.30 to 2. And that's when we'll take questions from you, the audience, and a back and forth with you. As questions come up along the way, please enter them into the Q&A box. Don't put them into the chat box. Put them into the Q&A box. That way, they'll be put all together in one spot, and I can curate them at the end. OK, so uh, with that, let me turn it over now to Karen. Karen, welcome. And Thank you. the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And uh, I always, I always love coming to talk about this topic. Um, it has been the, like the distinct pleasure and honor of mine to be able to enter this field um, uh, at, at just the right time. Uh, it's really revolutionized what, the way we treat cancer patients. And I think it's going to revolutionize how we treat cancer patients in the years to come. So I will talk to you today about CAR T cell therapy, really from clinical trials into real world practice. Um, these are my disclosures. So as an overview of the topics we'll cover today, I'll start looking at the, the early clinical trial data, looking at CD19 CAR T cells and B cell malignancies. Um, we'll look, take a look at their efficacy as well as mechanism and frequency of toxicities. We'll then talk about some of the real world data uh, after FDA approval in the United States, uh, specifically looking into lymphoma. We'll talk about some of the prolonged effects of therapy, and then we'll spend some time talking about where the field is moving uh, and how we're gonna move CAR T cell therapies into other diseases. So I know there are a variety of people on this uh, listening in, some of whom are very familiar with CAR T cell therapies and some of whom are not. I just thought I'd set the, the stage and the playing field as evenly as possible and really go back to basics and think about what is a CAR T cell and how is it made? So CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. Um, and uh, it refers to the receptor that is, uh, you know, uh, refers to the receptor that is the result of the genetic engineering of uh, either a patient or a healthy donor's own T cells uh, to generate a CAR T cell. So the receptor that gets, uh, that is uniquely expressed in these CAR T cells uh, is um, depicted here on the lower left-hand corner. Um, and it's, it's called a chimera because it's really part antibody molecule, which is the part of the receptor that's outside of the T cell that actually has the specificity for the tumor cell. Um, and it's in, so it binds to a protein on the surface of the tumor cell. And then it's part T cell activating molecule, really what these, these intracellular portions of the molecule are. Um, and so the cars we're going to talk about today are generally these second generation cars, which include a CD3 Zeta T cell activating molecule, and then a second co-stimulatory molecule in green, um, which for most of the cars we're going to talk about today is either 4-1-BB or CD2. And I'll talk about in a couple of slides the, the implication of the two different co-stimulatory molecules. 
Um, so that's what a CAR is, um, and it allows the T cell um, to recognize the tumor using the antibody portion of the molecule and then activate, become activated using the intracellular portion of the molecule uh, to hopefully kill the cell that it's bound to. The way these are made is that uh, we, when you have a patient who is a candidate for CAR T-cell therapy, uh, you collect T-cells from their blood through a process called phoresis. These T-cells are then sent to a laboratory where um, they are transfected, usually with either lentiviral or retroviral transfection. Uh, the, to, um, uh, their transfe those, are, those are vectors that carry the gene for the chimeric antigen receptor. The gene is then uh, you know, brought to the nucleus where it's expressed, uh, and then uh, the receptor is now on the surface of the, of the T cell. These cells are then uh, sent back to the cancer center where the patient undergoes uh, lymphodepleting chemotherapy. This is generally three days of chemotherapy, and it's not meant to treat the underlying cancer. It's actually meant to make the patient a better host uh, to allow the T cells to expand better and become activated upon reinfusion following the lymphodepleting chemotherapy. We will talk a little bit about some CAR T cells where we're actually directly Deriving the, CAR the T cells from a healthy donor later in the talk, but for the majority of the CAR T cells we're talking about uh, today, these are these come from the patient themselves. Um, this process from ident patient identification to patient treatment uh, can take anywhere from 16 or 17 days, all the way to about 30 to 40 days, depending on the different CAR T cells that we're talking about. All the while, these are patients that have an active malignancy. And so it is a challenge to uh, maintain uh, stability of the patient while their cancer is getting worse. And many of these patients have exhausted other treatment options. And so it's hard to control their cancer during that wait time. That's one of the major limitations of these uh, CAR T cells when they're derived from the patient themselves. So I think we have to think about what makes a cancer a good CAR T cell candidate to understand why this isn't sort of, after you see some of the data for CD19, why this isn't sort of taken over all of cancer care um, across the different cancer subtypes. And it's because the, the cancers that are good CAR T cell candidates, they, they have to have a tumor antigen that's present on all or most of the cancer cells so that, so that the T cells will kill all or most of the cancer cells. And it really has to be necessary for the cancer cell to survive um, so that it's not easily lost as a mechanism of resistance. But that tumor antigen really can't be present on normal healthy cells such that an immune attack on those normal healthy cells would lead to unacceptable toxicity. And so CD19 really emerged as a good CAR T cell candidate because it is present on all or most uh, B cell malignancies um, and B cell, uh, malignant B cells, I should say. Um, and it is necessary for those cells to survive. Um, so it's not easily lost. And it's only healthy counterpart that it's on is the, the normal B cell. And we know patients can live without B cells uh, because there are some genetic syndromes where patients are born without B cells. Um, and you know, this, the, the end result is that they don't make uh, antibodies or immunoglobulins to help protect them from infection. Um, but we can give people uh, transfusions of these uh, immunoglobulins and keep them free of infection and alive into their natural old age. So, um, so this was this was felt to be an acceptable a form of toxicity from an off tar off tumor but on target effect of the uh, CAR T cell. And so there are three now three FDA approved CAR T cells that target CD19 for um, the most common type of lymphoma we diagnose in the United States, uh, large B cell lymphoma. And that is axicaptogene silalucil or axicel, which is from a company called Kite, uh, tisogen leclusil or tisicel from a company, a company called Novartis from Novartis, <laughs> and then lysocaptogene marilucil or lysocell, which is from a, started with a company called Juno. It's now a BMS company. Company. And these three CAR T cells are actually all the same in terms of their antibody fragment. They all have this FMC63 green uh, antibody molecule outside the cell, which is what binds to CD19 on the, on the tumor cell. They all have a CD3 zeta T cell activating domain intracellularly, and they differ with respect to their, co their second co-stimulatory domain. So axi cell has a CD28 co-stimulatory domain, whereas TISA cell and lyso cell have a 4-1-BB co-stimulatory domain. And, the, and that has some important um, implications in terms of the pharmacokinetics of these CAR T cells upon reinfusion into the patient. So the CD28 CARs tend to expand very, very rapidly um, and actually reach a very high peak CAR 
T cell level um, uh, before they before the numbers start to come the number of cars start to come down over time. Whereas the 41BB cars tend to expand a little bit more slowly, reach a lower peak, and then uh, persist for a little bit longer before they come down. And the end result is that. Um, the uh, the toxicities that we'll talk about later tend to happen earlier and a little bit more pronounced uh, with the CD28 cars compared to the 41BB cars. Um, these cars also differ uh, by their mechanism of gene transfer. So for axi cell, they use a retroviral vector, whereas for tissa cell and lysocell, they use a lentiviral vector. And the last distinction really is for, for lysocell. Um, what comes back to the cancer center is not just one bag of cells, but actually two vials of cells, one with CD4 positive CAR T cells and one with CD8 positive CAR T cells. And they're meant to be in a one-to-one -one ratio so that you're giving a, a defined ratio of CD4 and CD8 T cells back to the the patient. Um, it's unclear if this is uh, important for activity, but uh, what, what comes back for AxiCell and TissaCell is a bag of cells, and none of us know exactly what's in, inside except that they are CAR T cells at the dose that uh, is FDA approved. So, uh, the, um, so I had mentioned that there were those three FDA approved products for large B cell lymphoma, but actually the first FDA approval for CAR T cells uh, came with uh, came in pediatric and young adult B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia based on this trial on the left, the Eliana study. Uh, so this was a study that included 75 patients uh, who were under the age of 25 with BALL. Uh, these are patients who had exhausted other treatment options, um, even so many of whom had relapsed after an allogeneic stem cell transplant, and there survival would have been on the order of, of weeks to months. Um, and with a, a single infusion of tisogen leclusal, uh, they, they entered a what we call a minimal residual disease negative complete response 81% uh, of the time. So 81% of patients had a complete response to therapy. And more importantly than that, at 12 months, 50% of patients had not had uh, their disease come back. So probably were cured of their leukemia, which is really remarkable remarkable, um, considering that this was a group of patients who were um, really out of treatment options and whose survival would, would have been quite limited. Um, and so that led to FDA approval. Um, at the FDA hearing, this little girl, Emily Whitehead, uh, uh, came and gave her testimonial. Um, at the time of FDA approval, I think she was about um, eight or nine years old, and she was uh, one or two years cancer-free. She's now eight years uh, cancer-free. Uh, she must have been three or four years cancer-free at the time. She's now eight years cancer-free um, and uh, still doing terrifically well. And so this is really why it matters. Um, we have looked at using CD19 CAR T cells in adults with ALL as well. Um, uh, the, this one study in the middle, the rocket study actually was quite effective, but the toxicity was unacceptable. And so uh, that product's no longer in clinical development. Um, but we just learned uh, a week, two weeks ago on Friday, um, that Brexicaptogene autolucil, which is closely related to AxiCell, um, was FDA approved for adult patients with B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia based on the results of the Zuma 3 study, which are shown here. So this included 71 patients um, and uh, the, C the complete response rate was 71%. And after about a, a little over a, under a year and a half uh, uh, follow-up, um, you can see that 50% um, uh, of patients are still in response at around 13 months, um, and about 50% uh, of patients are alive without disease relapse at 12 months, uh, similar to what we saw with uh, TISA cell. And so that was the most recent FDA approval, and now we can give CAR T cells to our adult patients with BALL as well. Um, and these are the three uh, clinical trials that led to the approval in large B cell lymphoma, Zuma 1 for axi cell, Juliet for tisogen leclusal, and Transcend for lysocaptogene marilucil. Um, and I think what's really just notable here is that um, typically with these patients with large B cell lymphoma who have failed to respond to multiple rounds of chemotherapy, um, the response rates to available therapies had been around 20 to 30%, and the complete response rates had been about under 10%. And the median overall survival was only about six months. Um, and on these three trials across the board, you can see, sorry, I didn't mean to do that yet. You can see that the response rates are in the 50 to 80% range. The complete responses are in the 40 to 50% range. 
Um, and at six months, which is a really good marker for long-term durable responses, you, we're seeing about 40% of patients still in response. And that really probably uh, means that these patients are cured um, with this therapy. Um, and so again, these were patients who, you know, uh, their options were really hospice or go on these trials and 50% of them ended up with a cure, which is really remarkable. And so that led to FDA approval for these three uh, products. Karen, I have a question for you. Um, are there reasons to pick one of these products over another? Uh, are, you know, what goes into choosing some of these above others? How do you compare them? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and so I think the, um, obviously we're balancing efficacy, safety, and then um, logistics here, which is a, a new factor when we're thinking about picking between therapeutic options for a patient, because most of the time our, our therapies are available in the pharmacy. We just order them and they come to the patient. But here we have to we have to think about sort of the logistics of collecting the cells, shipping them to a third party, the time it takes for manufacturing and the reliability of that manufacturing process and how those cells come back to the cancer center. And so, you know, I think we can think about safety and efficacy all we want. But the bottom line is if you have a patient in front of you, you have one chance to order one of these products most of the time because their cancer is progressing. And so you, so, you know, it doesn't matter if a product is a little bit more toxic, if it's not going to, if, if it's the one that's going to come back to you more reliable, reliably than a product that is uh, maybe a little bit less toxic, but less reliable. So the bottom, so what the, the truth is that on the Zuma one trial, and I think I'm going to get rid of this uh, bullet here, I want to look at this complete response rate by intent to treat. So these responses here are based on the number of patients who were actually treated, not the number of patients who were had their T cells collected. And I just want to call your attention to these, uh, you know, 111 patients on the Zuma one trial had cells collected and 101 were treated. So there were 10 patient drop off. Some of that was most of that was because of patient issues. The patient got too sick to get their cells. Only one product was not successfully manufactured. Whereas on the Juliet, there were over 50 patients who dropped out. Um, and on the Transcend study, it was even more. And that speaks to sort of reliability of manufacturing, um, one. And then it also speaks to the fact that the turnaround time for AxiCell is 17 days, the average turnaround. We sometimes get them back in 14 days. You know, it, it's the fastest turnaround time. For Tisicel, it's sort of reliably 22 days, but on the clinical trial, it was actually much longer. And for Lysocell, it can be anywhere from 24 to 30 days. Um, and that makes a difference. A week is a different is an important amount of time for these patients. And you know, you uh, if the folks at Kite can make AxiCell from almost no lymphocytes, whereas we do end up in situations where we get uh, a product that's not fit for reinfusion um, when we order Tisicel and Lysocell. So when when I have a really sick patient in front of me, I'm picking Axi. You know, what I don't think can wait. I'm picking AxiCell. When I have a I had mentioned before that the 41BB cars tend to be a little bit safer. Um, they uh, and that's that's Tisicel and Lysocell. And so, if I have an older patient who has a less uh, progressive lymphoma, maybe they have a little bit of kidney failure, maybe they have a little bit of heart failure. I'll be more inclined to pick one of these two products. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a balance. But what it means is that as we try, start to treat patients in the real world, and we're getting data about how these products perform in the real world, we're not comparing apples to apples. You can't say that AxiCell is better or less good than Tisicel or Lysocell because we're not treating the same patients with these products. It was a great question, maybe a long answer. <laughs> that was fantastic. I mean, that clinical perspective is so important. Thank you for that. Yeah, of course. Go on. All right. Um, so this is just, uh, these are just uh, Kaplan-Meier curves to really show, you know, both duration of response and progression-free survival after these CD19 CAR T cells in large cell lymphoma, which really across the board shows that patients who, of all patients, about 40 to 50% of them um, have these durable remissions. Most of the relapses happen in the first six months, and then it really plateaus out. And patients who have a complete response have a very high chance of maintaining that complete response uh, throughout follow-up. Up. And this is really why it matters. I, I had mentioned before sort of historical controls, uh, the complete response rate was about 10%, uh, overall response rate was about 30%. Um, on the CAR T cell trials, we're seeing response rates up to 80% and complete responses up to 50%. And th the curve here is really overall survival. So you can see about half of patients uh, uh, were unfortunately 
um, would pass away within six months uh, if CAR T cells didn't exist. Now you can see that it takes about um, about half the patients are still alive at 27 months uh, following CAR T cells. So it's a big, big improvement. And this is just a, an example for a, for what a patient experiences. This was the patient's lymphoma burden going into CAR T cells with AxiCell. And this is what their disease looked like at one month. And I know this patient actually um, uh, is still alive and in remission now about 18 months after his CAR T cell infusion. So large B-cell lymphoma is not the only type of lymphoma uh, that CAR T-cells work in. So it also works in a less common type of lymphoma called mantle cell lymphoma, which is one of our incurable types of mantle cell lymphoma, of lymphoma rather, uh, median survival is about 10 years. Um, and when, they, when patients with mantle cell lymphoma fail, you know, stop responding to a, really their second line therapy, which is a, a group of drugs called BTK inhibitors, their median survival is about six months. And they usually relapse very, very quickly. And, and sort of explosively at that point. Um, so these patients were uh, treated on the Zuma 2 study of brexacaptagy and autolucil, which is the same CAR T cell therapy that was just approved for adult patients with ALL. Um, and it, like I said, it's, it's very closely related to AxiCell. It's, it's actually just different because there's one step in manufacturing. Um, that is to purge the T cell collection product of CD19 positive B cells so that you don't have any lymphoma or leukemia cells in your product. Um, but otherwise it's exactly the same as AxiCell, uh, which means it's a CD28 car as well. Um, and with one in, with a single infusion of Brexacel, 93% of patients had a response and 67% had a complete response. And on this study, we have about a, an average of 18 month follow-up and it looks like about nearly 60% of people are still in response at 18 months. So this is really promising and even begs the question, are we going to be able to cure patients with mantle cell lymphoma now with CAR T cells? I can't say that yet. We need longer follow-up, but it's certainly provocative. Um, so here, just to also bring this back home to a patient, um, this was a patient that we treated on that Zuma 3 trial. It's a 55-year-old man. He had relapsed uh, high-risk uh, mantle cell lymphoma. He had all of the high-risk features. He had a mutation in TP53. He had the blastoid variant. He had a high key 67. Um, and he was refractory to uh, first-line chemo, second-line chemo, and then the BTK inhibitor, like I mentioned. So he received uh, Brexus cell on trial in November, 2018. He had a really uncomplicated course. We'll talk about the toxicities in a minute um, uh, and uh, actually went home at the earliest day he could possibly go home on day eight. And these are his pet, this was his PET scan going into treatment. And now he's, he actually just had his three-year PET scan as well. He continues to be in a complete response. Uh, this is someone who didn't go into, didn't respond to anything. So this was uh, really phenomenal. Um, another incurable lymphoma, more common than mantle cell lymphoma is follicular lymphoma. And so the Zuma 5 study looked at get using AxiCell for patients with both follicular and marginal zone lymphoma. Um, when these patients are in the, you know, in their third or fourth line of therapy, their median overall survival is about five years. So this, you know, many patients with follicular lymphoma can do well over their lifetime, but when they're multiply relapsed, uh, their longevity starts to become threatened. Um, and available agents for this group of patients usually lead to responses about 30% of the time and complete, uh, complete responses about 10% of the time. Um, and the response duration is usually only about one year. Um, here you can see that with AxiCell, um, uh, patient, 80% of patients had a complete response with follicular lymphoma. And at 18 months of follow-up, about 78% of patients are still in response. And so uh, th this trial also led to approval of AxiCell, an expanded approval for AxiCell in follicular lymphoma. And this is just to drive home that point that uh, this is much better than what we would see with other available agents. So when we look at response rate, it was 94% on Zuma 5 versus 50% in historical controls. Uh, complete response was 80% on Zuma 5 versus 30% in historical controls. And both progression-free survival, time to next treatment, and overall survival were all statistically superior after CAR T cells in this, in this setting. 
And so this is just, again, to show you what CAR T cells can do. This is a woman who had follicular lymphoma and you, she went through nine different lines of therapy. You can just see them all listed here um, over the course of about 10 years. Um, you know, she actually did quite well for the first five or so years of, or, or eight years of her disease. And then from between 2019 and 2021, she went through um, about eight additional lines of therapy and um, you can see sort of her PET scan and at the end of those eight lines of therapy right there. Um, so she was treated with AxiCell soon after it was FDA approved based on that trial I just, just showed you, had also a pretty uncomplicated course and went home pretty early. Um, and this is what her PET scan looked like at one month and, uh, and, uh, she, and she continues to do well. So this is, again, just to show what the power of this therapy and what it can do for patients who really have exhausted other therapies. Um, Tisagen uh, lefluso is also being looked at in follicular lymphoma on the Alara study, and we're seeing excellent the same excellent responses. I won't I won't go into all these details because I think we should get to some of the other um, some of the, the other aspects of these therapies. Do you have a, yeah. you had another question? <laughs> I was just about to ask. I mean, that's terrific news, but what's the bad news? You know, what are the yeah, risks? So, yeah, yeah. That we are going to talk about that right now. So um, there is always a yin to the yang with these therapies. Um, and uh, CAR T cells have a really unique uh, toxicity profile compared to other cancer therapies, just based on the nature of how they work. So the first thing we worry about, worry about when we give patients CAR T cells is um, a syndrome called cytokine release syndrome. Uh, and this, we, we, we really do understand the pathophysiology of cytokine release syndrome. So um, these T cells are reinfused back into the patient they encounter antigen and they are, are activated. And part of that activation process is to start secreting cytokines into the bloodstream. Those cytokines then serve to activate other immune effector cells, which then further elaborate these inflammatory cytokines. And so you get this, this uh, cytokine cascade. Um, and so at a minimum, you can get flu-like symptoms. It's sort of the same concept of what our immune system does when we're, when we're combating the flu. Um, with fever, malaise, um, body aches, headaches, um, but we we can't modulate sort of the level of activation. And so, if it, it gets too, if it comes on too strong, patients can get capillary leak, where fluid leaks out of the blood vessels and can cause the blood pressure to go down or to uh, cause fluid to accumulate in the lungs, and that can lead to low blood pressure and difficulty breathing. That can progress to you know frank shock, um, at where patients need you know medicines to support their blood pressure, or you know, respiratory failure. And that's where patients would need to go to a, go to an ICU. That's sort of what we call grade three or high grade, uh, three or four or high grade cytokine release syndrome. Um, uh, cytokine release syndrome usually happens early after CAR T cell infusion, lasts for several days. It kind of mirrors the peak CAR T cell expansion and then will get better on its own as long as the patient can survive that. Um, and what follows is, is a unique toxicity call, that we call immune effector cell related um, or associated neurologic syndrome or ICANS, or we also call it neurotoxicity. And we don't totally understand what causes this, except that we know that it involves some degree of inflammation of the brain. It can be very scary for patients and their family members. This inflammation of the brain can increase their risk of seizures. And most of our patients are maintained on anti-seizure medicines because of that risk. It can cause a variety of, uh, you know, a variety of neurologic symptoms from mild confusion to uh, difficulty both speaking and understanding language, and then really an inability to take care of themselves. And some patients can become, you know, frankly, comatose. Um, and uh, it can last for a couple of days, or in some, some patients, it lasts for a couple of weeks. So it's very variable. Um, and uh, when patients do recover, they recover fully. We don't, you know, that we don't think they, this causes permanent neurologic damage, but there have been cases where the, the inflammation in the brain causes brain swelling. Um, and when the brain swells and doesn't have enough room to expand, it can lead to a herniation of the brain, which can be a fatal event. So these are really serious toxicities that we, that, you know, we're, we're we're constantly being vigilant about and why many of our patients receive these uh, cells in the hospital so they can be monitored very, very closely. Um, uh, I won't go into all of this. We've been trying to learn more about sort of what can predict for and what causes neurologic toxicity so we can come up with better therapeutics for it, both preventative as well as to treat it. Right now, our mainstay for treating neurologic toxicity after CAR T cells are steroids to decrease that inflammation in the brain. Um, but this is sort of the crux of, you know, 
uh, of, of what we've learned from these therapies. So um, I, I just only call your attention to grade three cytokine release syndrome and grade three neurologic toxicity, because those are the ones where patients may need to go to the ICU. Uh, and as you can see across these studies, uh, there are a couple of themes. So one is that this, the grade three toxicities are higher in the CD28 cars compared to the 41BB cars. So for instance, compare Zuma one to transcend, right? 13% grade three CRS versus two. 28% grade three neurologic toxicity versus 10. You can't really interpret grade three CRS on the Juliet study because they use a different scale, but the neurologic toxicity was graded similarly. Um, the, other, the other theme from this is that um, for whatever reason, uh, CAR T cells in the uh, in follicular lymphoma, which is a slow growing lymphoma, leads to significantly less high grade toxicity than it does in diffuse large B cell lymphoma and mantle cell lymphoma. So CD28 for CD28 CAR, um, the toxicity is about half in follicular lymphoma than it is in uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma and mantle cell lymphoma. And the highest toxicity we see with CD19 CARs is actually in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, so I mentioned that, um, you know, because since these have been FDA approved since 2017, um, we've had ample opportunity to see how these cars perform in the real world, where patients would not be sort of perfect clinical trial candidates or, or eligible for these clinical trials. They may have met other medical comorbidities or um, needed to have other treatments uh, while the cells were being manufactured. And so, when, and uh, you know, many people thought they would not do as well when we treated a broader population of patients. And so, on, on many of these series that I'm showing you here, about 60% of patients would not have been eligible for the clinical trials uh, for either AxiCell or Tisicel. Um, and what you what you can see across the board is it's still about a, a you know a 60 to 80 percent uh, response rate. It's still about a you know 40 to 60 percent complete response rate. And and also importantly at six months, uh, about 40 to 50% of patients are maintaining their response, which is sort of a good predictor of long-term response. And so it looks like they're just as effective, even though these are sicker patients. Um, and we're not seeing an increase in toxicity. We're seeing the same rates of grade three and higher CRS and neurologic toxicity. Uh, in fact, we may be even seeing an improvement in toxicities over time, and owing to the fact that we've gotten better at sort of uh, treating patients earlier with some of our toxicity mitigating agents um, to prevent it from escalating to higher grade toxicity. Um, from all of these studies, both uh, clinical trials and some of these real world experiences, we've learned about some predictors of response and toxicity. So on the side of improved response, we know that patients who have a low tumor burden and low pretreatment LDH, which is a marker of tumor burden, and low pretreatment inflammatory markers are more likely to have durable responses. Patients who, even though patients who have medical comorbidities didn't necessarily affect um, outcomes on those real world experiences, when you look particularly at those those patients, they do seem to do a little bit less well than the patients who otherwise were medically fit. And then patients who didn't need bridging therapy between the time that their cells were collected and their time that their cells were given back to them also seem to do better. Remember, these T cells are mostly coming from the patient themselves. And these are cancer patients who have had received a lot of anti-cancer therapy. So their T cells, their immune cells may not be similar across the board. And in fact, when, when patients have more early memory differentiated T cells, collected or in their T-cell product, they tend to do better. So the, the sort of the fitness of the T-cell matters. Um, and then patients who are able to, to reach a higher peak CAR T-cell level compared to their tumor burden can actually overcome the negative impact of a high tumor burden. So that it's that ratio that seems to be more important than the tumor burden itself. Um, and now we're starting to look at the tumor and try to understand, you know, what are some of the factors within the tumor that can lead to resistance. And what the group at Stanford was able to show that mutations in CD58 um, actually lead to downregulation of CD58, which is a binder, uh, which is a ligand for CD2 on the T cells. And so loss of CD58 may lead to insufficient T cell activation, and those patients do less well. We're also learning that the CAR T cells may not do all the killing of the tumor cells when they get to the tumor. They actually uh, probably serve to, to do some the initiation of the killing, but then they activate a bunch of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that are already sitting there to do the rest of the killing. And so tumors that are have high tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and low suppressor cells, these myeloid-derived suppressor cells, um, 
actually tend to have longer, uh, more durable outcomes. Um, and then tumors that don't overexpress the oncogene MYC also tend to have longer um, remissions. Uh, on the side of increased toxicity, um, we know that patients going into CAR with a high tumor burden, high pretreatment inflammatory markers, and high pretreatment LDH are more likely to have higher grade toxicities. And then once patients get their CAR T cells, if their CAR T cells peak at higher levels, if their cytokine levels peak at higher levels, they're at increased risk for these toxicities. If they develop markers of a condition called disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, they may develop high grade toxicity. And patients who have early cytokine release syndrome are at a are greater risk of having high grade CRS as well as high grade neurologic toxicity. And so I don't have time to go through each of these. These, these really are just some of the slides to like uh, to elucidate some of those points, but I'll go through them very, very quickly. Um, uh, the bottom panel is the one that I wanna call your attention to here. These are in black are the patients who would have been eligible for the ZUMA-1 clinical trial, whereas in red are the patients who are ineligible because of medical comorbidities. And I just wanna call your attention to the fact that even though these patients in red do better than what we would expect with other available therapies, they do less well than patients without medical comorbidities. And so it does raise the question that these are a group of patients we still need better options for. And this is uh, just a look at uh, the ZUMA-1 study showing that tumor burden is a negative predictor of long-term outcomes. However, if patients are able to uh, achieve a high peak CAR T cell uh, level uh, compared to their tumor burden ratio, um, that, that that can overcome that negative influence of high tumor burden. Um, and this is another way to look at tumor burden. It's actually looking at circulating tumor DNA. Um, and so if before treatment, patients have very high levels of circulating tumor DNA, they, they tend to do less well versus those who have low levels, they tend to respond more favorably. And then following treatment, you can use that same test for circulating tumor DNA to test the, the depth of remission. We call this minimal residual disease. And if uh, patients are MRD negative, um, which are shown here in the blue, uh, they have excellent outcomes where patients who are MRD positive one month after treatment tend to relapse uh, and do less well. Um, I had mentioned that the T-cell product is important. And so the group at Penn uh, noticed that only 25% of patients with CLL had durable outcomes, uh, which is chronic lymphocytic leukemia had durable outcomes after CD19 CARs. And so they took the CAR T-cells from their responders and gave them to mouse models of CLL and those mice did well. And then when you gave CAR T-cells from patients who didn't respond to the same mice, mouse models, th th those mice did not do well. So it told them that it was something about the T-cell itself and not the patient or the disease disease that was important for a response in this case. And so they then did gene expression profiling, which showed that um, responders had more early memory differentiated T cells. Um, they also had greater STAT3 signaling. So these were more activatable. Um, the, by flow, that these, they also showed that um, responders had T cells that were more early memory differentiated and that non-responders had uh, higher levels of exhaustion markers on the surface of the T cell. Um, and so uh, one thing that you can do to try to make the T cells a little bit fitter before you collect them is actually treat patients with therapies that can do this. And BTK inhibitors can do this. And so this group at Penn actually then went on to give patients with CLL BTK inhibitors for at least six months before they collected their T cells, and they were able to show uh, better than uh, better than standard responses uh, to CAR T cells in that setting. This is just that data for CD58. Um, so the mutant CD58 patients were all bound to relapse um, versus the patients that were CD58 wild type. And so what this group is proposing is a novel CAR T cell um, where not only does it have a CD3 zeta activating domain and a 4-1-BB co-stimulatory domain, but it has a constitutively active CD2 domain so that um, it can overcome the loss of uh, CD58 in some of these lymphomas. Um, here's some data just to show that, that concept that, you know, it's not the CARs that do all the work within the tumor, but it's other tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So uh, the top is work done by Scott Rodig at Dana-Farber, where um, the green cells are actually the, the um, 
CAR T cells and the white cells are non-CAR T cells. So you can see how many of the activated T cells within the tumor after CAR T cell infusion are actually normal T cells compared to the one green CAR T cell and the bottom panel, the CAR T cells in red. Uh, so same concept. And then the group at Novartis looked at, at patients treated on the Juliet study and showed that patients whose pretreatment tumor biopsies had a higher proportion of CD3 positive T cells had more durable responses than patients who had fewer tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Those are shown in orange here. Um, I'm going to skip this just for the sake of time, but the, the bottom line here is that um, the tumor itself can influence the tumor microenvironment and tumors that have certain gene expression profiles that are enriched for interferon gamma, uh, interferon gamma gene signature. Uh, tend to have less durable responses. And this, is the, the, this may be because of two things. One is that there are more myeloid derived suppressor cells and the other is that it actually inhibits CAR T cell expansion. Um, and so that, that's, that's what's shown here. Um, so there's a lot of things we've learned over, over the years to think about how to move this uh, CAR T cell therapy into the future and how to improve, you know, a 40 to 50% cure rate to something higher and how to move this into other types of tumors. So one is we want to make safer cars. Um, these are cars that uh, either have increased signaling complexity at the immunologic synapse, so either require two signals to become activated, or if there's a second signal, it, it actually inhibits the CAR T cell or cars that actually have more physiologic signaling through the T-cell receptor itself. And then we obviously we want to overcome mechanisms of resistance. So a major mechanism is exhaustion of the T cells. And so people are looking at, at combining CARs with checkpoint inhibitors and other immunomodulatory agents, or even further gene editing of the CAR T cell to, to knock out some of those genes uh, that lead to T cell exhaustion. And people are also looking at alternative conditioning regimens that maybe can lead to more favorable tumor microenvironments so that the CAR T cells don't get quite as exhausted before they get there. Um, I mentioned before, before that what makes a good CAR T cell is uh, that the antigen is necessary for the uh, tumor to survive um, and can't be easily lost, but we do see loss of CD19. It's not actual total loss of CD19, it's CD19 that's alternatively spliced so that the epitope for the, that the CAR binds to is no longer expressed. So they still get signaling through CD19 and it keeps the B cell alive, but the, there's no way for the CAR to, to find it. And and so people are looking at dual antigen targeting cars that combine, um, that target more than one tumor antigen to lose the, uh-oh. never happened to me before. Karen, I have a copy of her slides. Do you want me to control the deck for my screen? So my screen is just black. I'm so, so I'm trying to join by my phone and then I, I will have you. <laughs> um. All right. All right. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, can okay, can okay, can okay. You're getting a uh, an echo. All right, I'm back. <laughs> I'm so sorry about this. I, I have no Karen, idea what just like happened. To, would you like me to step in with the slides I have? Yes, you? yes, that would be great. That's fine. Okay. So this was the one that you were on before. Yep. Right. So, and so, so I was I was getting to the concept of antigen loss and the fact that the um, 
that uh, by, combi by, by having CAR T cells that can target more than one antigen, you lose the selective pressure for antigen loss. Um, and then we, we, there's a lot of focus on, on the, the composition of the T cell product itself. Um, and uh, like I mentioned before, that group at Penn looked at pre-treating patients with BTK inhibitors, which can shift CAR T cell, the, the T cells in the patient to a more early memory differentiated phenotype. And so people are looking at that uh, versus actually using some of these drugs ex vivo during manufacturing and tissue culture to try to shift the phenotype of the T cells before you get them back to the patient. And then finally, um, I had mentioned one of the biggest limitations of this um, is the fact that um, of this therapy is the fact that it takes so long uh, to make the CAR T cells for patients who are sick. The other limitation, of course, is cost. These are very expensive to make. And so increasing accessibility is obviously a major concern. And so people are starting to look at doing this with allogeneic CAR T cells from, derived from healthy donors or alternative uh, cell products like NK CARs. Um, and so those are, those are some of the, the directions that, we're, that we are moving. Um, so I think you can go. Uh, so there are endless engineering possibilities. I'm not going to go through each one of these uh, in particular, but ways that what we could both increase activity, uh, recruit other uh, cells within the tumor microenvironment, avoid inappropriate activation of the CAR T cells. And these, these are all uh, shown here. Um, and so these are all concepts that are sort of starting to enter preclinical development, although not quite into clinical trials yet. Next slide. I had mentioned, I already mentioned this, uh, I think in, in a lot of detail about the fact that it's not so much that CD19 is lost as a mechanism of resistance, but that it's alternatively spliced. And so the binding epitope for the CAR T cell is lost. And so if you can't bind to it, you can't kill the cell that, that has the truncated CD19 on the surface. So this is this is a major mechanism of resistance in ALL. Um, it's less so in lymphoma to date. Next slide. But, but uh, one of the ways to try to decrease this risk is to start treating patients with CARs that target more than one tumor antigen. So these CARs that are shown on the left, on the right here rather, um, target CD20 and CD19 or CD19 and CD22. And so there's a little bit less selective pressure to lose CD19. Some of the early data that we're seeing so far on these clinical trials though, is that they seem to be about the same in terms of efficacy um, as the CD19 CARs by themselves. Next slide. Um, this was that study out of the uh, out of the University of Pennsylvania, looking at improving T cell health by giving patients abrutinib, one of those BTK inhibitors, pretreatment. Um, so they were actually able to show that the T cells were better um, after uh, treatment with abrutinib by all measures, and that the outcome of uh, patients treated with CAR T cells from T cells that were collected after abrutinib were much better than what they had been seeing beforehand. Next slide. Uh, Karen, I have a quick question for you. Yeah, of course. So you said that, you know, uh, for some patients who are getting sicker and sicker while they're waiting for their CAR T cells to get created, um, you know, they may not remain well enough to benefit from the treatment. Are, are people trying to use off the shelf T cells or even donor cells to kind of reduce that cost and that wait time? Yeah. So, so yeah, so that was, so it was my last point on two slides before this. So, so um uh, people are starting to look at donor-derived CAR T cells. They're looking at NK cells too, which can be derived from um, uh, umbilical cord uh, or healthy donors. Um, and so the advantage of this is that the, the cells can be frozen and available you know, in your freezer, available for patients on demand. Um, you can also make uh, about 100 products from one pharesis. And so that also potentially can bring down the cost of these CAR T cells because you can treat many more patients uh, from the same uh, you know, from, from the same collection. Um, the, the concern, of course, was that these are from donors and they could cause graft versus host disease, right? They could, these T cells could interact with healthy tissues um, and lead to um, immune attack on healthy tissues because th those healthy tissues would be felt to be different. Um, the, um, uh, from, you know, and, and foreign, um, the way they combat that is they actually get rid of the T cell receptor in these donor T cells. And that's where they actually, they put the CAR gene in, in the T cell receptor uh, position so that these, these cells don't cause graft versus host disease. Uh, the bigger problem actually is the host versus T cell response. So these T cells still have um, antigens on their surface that the 
the host will respond to and say, oh, you don't belong here, I'm gonna get rid of you before you can have an anti-lymphoma effect. And so the end result is that most of these companies have had to enhance that lymphodepletion so that we decrease the host's immune, um, the ability to, for the host to launch an immune response. Um, and what comes with that is, you know, potentially increased infectious risk. Um, and so, the, you know, we're starting to see proof of concept that we can get the same response rates from these cells, but, but, but it is potentially at the cost of increased um, increased infection. Um, and we don't know yet if these cells are going to be as durable as uh, cells collected from the patient themselves, because uh, we just don't have long enough follow up data. But some of that data is shown here on the slide that you're showing right now. Um, then we can go to the next slide. And this is just the to show some of the early work for NK cells as an alternative cell source. Next slide. Um, and this is a really interesting um, uh, uh, concept, which is to actually generate the CAR T cells in vivo. Um, so you actually use nanoparticles that have a CD3 antibody on their surface to deliver the CAR gene direct. You, you inject the patient with the nanoparticles. Because of the CD3 antibody, they bind to T cells, deliver the gene directly to the T cells, and, and, and then the, cars, the CAR gene starts to be expressed on the surface of T cells. Um, um, and so it's not, this is not out of preclinical development yet, but we may be moving into a field where you don't have to create these CAR T cells ex vivo, but you can actually just inject these nanoparticles directly into the patient and let the, let the T cell uh, engineering happen within the body. Next slide. Um, and so the, I had showed you this slide before just to show that it, you know, we're starting to understand some of the biomarkers as well as mechanisms of neurologic toxicity, and you can hit Next slide. And so what this is leading to is now trials of a variety of different uh, drugs and therapies to see if we can both treat and prevent neurologic toxicity uh, more effectively. Next slide. Um, I mentioned bef uh, before that um, uh, we want to expand CAR T cells into other diseases and, and the next disease that's been, um, or the next target that has been uh, uh, successful is uh, B cell maturation antigen, which is a marker for multiple myeloma. It's a marker of plasma cells, which are the cancer cells in a, in a blood cancer called multiple myeloma. Um, next slide. And so uh, there is an FDA approved product targeting BCMA and multiple myeloma. myeloma. It's called Idacaptogene Viclusal. Um, and it was FDA approved based on this study, the KARMA study, which showed that these are multiply relapsed myeloma patients. And you can see that the, um, the response rate is about 73% and the complete response rate is about 30%. Um, and patients who achieve a complete response have about a 20 month uh, median progression free survival means meaning that they're alive and without disease relapse during that time. Um, so this is a, a great advancement for patients with mul re multiply relapsed multiple myeloma. Next slide. Um, we are awaiting the FDA approval of a second product in myeloma, siltacaptogene autolucil or siltacel, um, and uh, that's uh, based on the results of this study, the CARTITUDE 1 study. So this is being reviewed by the FDA as we, as we speak, um, but this is even more effective where 97% of patients responded and 67% of them had a complete response, many of whom had really deep complete responses with MRD negativity. Next slide. Um, and here you can see because the depth of response is so great, uh, the actual overall progression free survival is over 20 months on this study. So, um, you know, really offering a substantial benefit to these multiply relapsed myeloma patients. Next slide. Uh, toxicity in, in multiple myeloma with the BCMA cars is different than in with the CD19 cars. So cytokine release syndrome happens pretty commonly, but grade three or higher happens in you know five percent or less of the time. So it's less frequent than with CD19 cars. You almost see almost no neurologic toxicity, although you do see some, um, except with Silta cell, where there is an unusual neurologic toxicity that looks a little bit more like Parkin Parkinson's disease, um, and uh, the uh, reason for that is that we, they've actually found that uh, cells in the substantia nigra in the brain express BCMA to a low level. And these, uh, so it does look like you're getting some immunologic activity in the substantia nigra, which are the, is the area of the brain that's affected in Parkinson's disease. Next slide. Um, we are starting to see uh, 
car is being developed for Hodgkin lymphoma, where the target is actually CD30, which is a, a, a unique marker on the surface of the Hodgkin lymphoma cancer cell, the Reed Sternberg cell. Um, and uh, so we've seen some early phase data. Now the phase two sort of multi-center large clinical trials are ongoing. Next slide. And I don't mean to go through all the data on this slide uh, in detail, but it really, I just want to call your attention to what's in blue, which is, you know, no responses, complete responses in a small percentage of patients, responses in a small percentage of patients. This is what CAR T cells look like in other diseases and other solid tumors. Next slide. So a lot of work to go. So why is it that they, they may not work as well? So one is that they may not have good tumor antigens. Um, uh, next Next, um, so um, a couple of strategies to overcome that are these cars that target more than one uh, tumor antigen, uh, especially if the tumor antigen isn't, isn't universally expressed, um, or, or a concept called armored cars, where the cars are actually engineered to secrete immunostimulatory cytokines um, within the tumor microenvironment to enhance the recruitment of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that are already there. The other problem is these cells may not be getting to the tumor, right? So it's hard to try that these lymphocytes uh, may not be trafficking into these hostile tumor microenvironments. Next slide. And so people are starting to engineer cars that actually express either chemokine receptors or receptors for the tumor microvasculature to help facilitate this T cell trafficking. And then lastly, when they do get to the tumor, the microenvironment may be so um, inhibitory uh, that it can decrease T cell activation and proliferation and cytotoxicity, both because of some of these myeloid derived suppressor cells that we've talked about or some tumor associated macrophages. Next slide. And so some of the solutions for that include combining cars with some of those checkpoint inhibitors, like I've talked about earlier, uh, those armored cars that I had just mentioned, or even alternative conditioning to sort of target the tumor associated macrophages and myeloids derived suppressor cells so that they are less inhibitory um, and, and, uh, and the cars have less, to, uh, they're, they're up against less when they get to the tumor. Next slide. So 2010 was when uh, the first CD19 cars were being tested in single institution centers uh, just to see if they had activity. Um, and then in you know, 10 short years, we've seen an explosion of car trials across the globe. So these are just the different, um, the different the, the number of clinical trials across the globe, and you can see that you know China and the U.S. are certainly leading this effort. But um, but there are just this has been a, an explosion um, uh, in medicine and in in cancer care, um, and so I I'm really really optimistic that you know we are going to see big you know we already have seen leaps and bounds of improvement uh, from from this last decade, but in the next de decade I think we're going to see uh, cars for the more common type of cancers like lung cancer and breast cancer and colon cancer. And we're going to start to see the benefit of this therapy to a broader population of patients. Next slide. Um, so just in summary, um, the future of CARs in oncology, we really need to focus on some of that toxicity management. Um, we need to develop safer CARs, more prophylactic strategies to decrease um, the risks of these toxicities and newer treatments for these toxicities. We have to overcome mechanisms of resistance um, and we're starting to do that in a variety of ways, including dual antigen targeting CARs, combination with checkpoint inhibitors, um, looking at the T cell product, and then also looking at the tumor microenvironment. And then overcoming issues of cost and manufacturing inefficiencies, we talked about a bit about the universal off-the-shelf allogeneic CAR T cells as well as NK CARs. And then uh, we, again, the biggest thing is to expand the indications, um, identifying new targets, um, and new cell sources, new ways of manufacturing, all to be able to treat some of the more common cancers with this really revolutionary therapy. Next slide. And with that, I will, I think I'm perfectly on time to take questions. I really wish I could see everybody. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. All right, well, thank you so much for that presentation. I'm glad that we were able to use the backup slides. Um, well, you know, I, I certainly have questions that have come in. Let me sort of prime the pump a little bit. I want to ask you one of my uh, initial leading questions. I'm really curious to get your point of view of what it's like in your experience, both as a physician and as an investigator, 
Do you ever run into situations where you think the two roles might be at a little bit of a tension? You know, would you as a physician think that it would be optimal to provide or offer the therapy at a different time course in the patient's disease progress as maybe you might want to recommend as an investigator? I'm really kind of curious about, is there a possible tension there between how you interact with the patient as their caregiver and how you might kind of think of them as a research subject? Yeah, so yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so, um, you know, early on the diseases that we were treating, as I mentioned, were diseases that um, really had no other options. People were lining up uh, for these for these spots on these clinical trials, and in fact, people would talk about you know that every center would have a wait list uh, for for these slots, and and patients were referring it on online forums as the death list, right? If you if you weren't at the top, you know you, you were if you were thirty on the list, you were only hoping that the other the twenty nine patients didn't make it for whatever reason, and it was just this it was this really kind of horrible um, situation, and and um, because there were just few way fewer slots than we had patients. Now we have FDA approved products, but we obviously as a field need to improve those products. But how do you how do you think about enrolling a patient on a clinical trial with an unknown safety and unknown efficacy uh, um, profile when you know that you can give them a, a commercially available product off of a clinical trial? You know, so the push and pull there is, you know, you want to give someone, you want to, it's really hard to tell a patient, well, take a risk and take a product that may not be as effective or maybe more toxic, uh, but, it, but it could be the reverse, and that's what we're trying to test. Um, uh, you know, that's hard to do as a patient's clinician, um, but on the flip side, as a researcher, you know that the only way we're going to make this better for patients is if we continue to test these products in clinical trials. We are in a unique situation now where we want to make these products better. There's there are a lot of room to make it better, but it's hard to really um, ethically, um, you know, try to convince, you know, try to, you know, to talk to a patient about recommending a clinical trial over sort of a known entity. And then I think in the, when we started to expand CARS into some of the subtypes of lymphomas where there are lots of other options, that's a tough, that's a really challenging uh, uh, discussion as well, right? Because, you know, you, you want to see if these are going to change the natural history of these incurable diseases with long natural histories, but those patients may, may die with their disease, not of it. And they they may do very well with something less toxic and um, and less uh, sort of less invasive. So um, those are those are also challenges. Um, uh, and you know, I think the bottom line is it's 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 often comes down to a really a really in depth conversation with the patient in terms of what's important to them and uh, and and what how you think you can best meet those sort of priorities of the patient. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start turning it over to some of the questions that have come in. I want to stay on this vein of thought just a little bit longer, but maybe shift the focus a little bit more to the patient. So this question comes from Bob True. He's the director of the Center for Bioethics. He says, uh, given the yin-yang relationship between efficacy and toxicity, do you ever take the individualized preferences of the patient into account in terms of dosage? For example, bigger dose, more effective and more toxic or uh, whether and when to give the steroids, et cetera. Do you give patient preferences and give, give them, take them into account? If not, why not? Yeah, so that's, that's so the doses for the doses for these products are fixed. Um, we we don't get to sort of modulate those doses. Actually, we have we are we're sort of it's it's all the honor system. The bag comes back to us, and we're told it's this dose, uh, and and we don't have any way of verifying that. Um, and so you know the dose is fixed. Um, we are. Uh, you know, we have a lot of patients who who were very worried early on about you know giving patients giving them steroids or some of the other drugs that we use to combat some of these toxicities that it would make their cars not work and it often was a, a could have been a long discussion at the bedside explaining why it was so important to give steroids at that point or to give tocilizumab which is the drug we use for cytokine release syndrome um, that's become less uh, less of a discussion because because so many of the studies have shown that those giving the drugs to treat these toxicities toxicities has not uh, led to a decrement in efficacy. And so um, that hasn't been, so that's, that's really kind of going by way of the wayside, you know, going 
uh, that's going, we're no longer experiencing that, that issue. Um, the, um, I think the sort of patient preference comes in almost exactly leading from the, the last comment I made before we went to this question, which is, you know, when, when you have, when you have a patient who has other treatment options, how, but those treatment options may be indefinite dosing of a drug, it could be chronic low-grade toxicities as opposed to a single infusion with, you know, a, a defined period of high-grade toxicities. Um, you know, that's where the patient preference really comes in, where you have to you have a discussion with the patient about, you know, again, what's important to them, you know, what they'd rather live with, what, what kind of risk they would want to take, how important is it for them to be off of therapy um, as, a, you know, with a one-and-done therapy versus is, you know, sort of chronic and definite therapy. So um, those are the, those, it's when the patient has multiple options that those are the kind of discussions that come into play. Great. Um, so Dr. Terry Ross Bard has a question. Are there any studies that have tried CAR T therapies as a first line treatment? Yeah, so that's a great question. So one thing we didn't discuss, you know, obviously right now, as, as with all cancer therapies, we start in the multiply relapse setting where patients are without many options. We always think that these therapies will work better in patients as an earlier line of therapy. Um, and um, and so um, there, there have been three randomized studies looking at CAR T cells in the second line. So right now, CAR T cells for large B cell lymphoma are actually only approved in the third line and beyond. And so there are three randomized trials looking at these, the three approved CAR T cells in large B cell lymphoma in the second line. Um, and they, they have completed, two of them were positive favoring CAR T cells over other second line therapies where the third was actually not positive. Um, there was a, another trial looking at AXI cell for, for very high high risk large cell lymphoma patients where they started patients on standard chemotherapy for two treatments. And if they had, if they didn't have a sufficient response by um, radiographic imaging, they then got CAR T cells instead of going on to receive more chemotherapy. Um, and that was a single arm study, but the results look quite good. Um, the problem with um, the diseases that we've treated so far is that frontline therapy actually works quite well. So, you know, 65 to 70% of patients with large cell lymphoma will be cured with their frontline chemotherapy. Um, and so, and we don't have a really good tool to identify the 30 to 35% of patients that aren't going to be cured. So the best tool we have is that they relapse. Um, and so I think until we can identify who those patients are, before we start them on at diagnosis, before we start them on treatment, we're not going to be able to move CAR T cell therapy up because CAR T cell therapy has a higher mortality and a higher risk than standard chemotherapy for frontline large B cell lymphoma. Now that may be very different for diseases like metastatic colon cancer and lung cancer where our frontline therapies are not as effective. If we can get CAR T cells to work in that setting, that may be primed to move them up to frontline treatment. So interesting. So I have a question from one of our um, graduate students in bioethics, Rigo. He wants to know, what's the quality of life for the patients during this therapy? And I wanna to add to this too, another question from Dr. Bard. What are the frequencies of the toxicities you mentioned? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the so, <laughs> it's a big, it's a big spectrum, and and we also don't have a great way of uh, guessing how it's how patients are going to fare. Um, so there are some patients who get their CAR T cells. They may have a day or two of fever. They may have nothing, and they just kind of sit in the hospital bored and want to go home. Um, and there are others that are in the hospital for four weeks. Um, and so obviously, quality of life is very different on those two spectrums. We have some people who say like, I don't know, I went home on day eight. I went back to work at six weeks. I, I like I was back in my life, you know, it was, it was wonderful. And there are other patients that say, well, I was in the hospital for four weeks. I was you know, totally confused, couldn't speak. Um, and by the end of it, I had to go to rehab and it took six months for me to recover from this. So it's a big spectrum, which is why, um, you know, working on some of the safer cars um, and also working on some of the toxicity mitigating strategies so that we can prevent the sort of outliers in, um, in the negative direction are so important. Um, but, but it is important, but for the vast majority of people, you know, it's about two weeks in the hospital. It's about another two to four, maybe six week recovery. Um, and then patients really do feel 
back to normal. And you compare that to, you know, some standard treatment regimens that take six months to go through, or even some other drugs that you, you stay on until you progress, which could be years, where you experience low level toxicities the whole time. And you know, or, you know, have to constantly be exposed uh, to these therapies. Um, that is, you know, there's, there, it's important, that's an important distinction between these two types of therapies. And the studies are now only starting to look at quality of life endpoints. So people can really address whether this is, you know, superior to what we've been doing and treating our cancer patients with uh, beforehand. Yeah, I'd like to start moving the discussion now toward cost issues and access issues. Uh, about how much does the therapy on average cost? And this is not including like for complications, hospitalization, but just the actual CAR T cell therapy. Generally, what's that price range? Yeah, so it's uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. The CAR T cell therapies that are approved uh, range in cost from about $363,000 to $475,000 per mm -hmm. product. Is that at all covered by insurance? And does like, for example, Medicare take care of any of that? Yeah, so it's almost universally covered by insurance. Um, of course, uh, you know, so from private insurance, um, it's, you know, it's covered almost in full. Um, but the, for Medicare, um, reimbursement is not one-to-one. -one. <laughs> so there, you know, so it's, I, I am not, um, you know, a hospital finance person. So I, I you know, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to kind of what the losses are um, in terms of treating Medicare patients, but there, it was a, it's a real issue for some centers where, you know, it rate in, certainly raises some ethical issues about, you know, can hospitals survive if they're, you know, treating a majority of Medicare patients and losing a lot of money with each patient that they treat. And there were some centers that had said they would, had a quota for how many patients with Medicare they would treat. And some patients who said they would not treat anybody with Medicare, um, you know, we're, we're, we're lucky to live in Boston um, and, uh, and work where we do. And, um, uh, you know, Dana-Farber and Brigham and Women said that that is not, uh, they, they would not get into that business where they would uh, have quotas for Medicare patients um, or disallow treatment of Medicare patients. Is it possible for some hospitals to make a decision about what version of the therapy to offer the patient based on cost and not what may be optimal for the patient? Or are these therapies close enough that it wouldn't really be that kind of trade-off? Um, th right now, they're close enough that it's hard to imagine that kind of trade off, but it is certainly, po you know, you do have to, every time one of these therapies is approved, you know, talk to your hospital's formulary board and, and justify why you need the third product or the second product. Um, and uh, there, there, um, there have been, you know, in the land of transplant, in the world of transplant, there, there have been payers that have made, you know, unique financial relationships with certain centers and said, if you have our insurance, you can only get your transplant Plan at, at X, Y, and Z center. You can't go to A, B, and C. Um, and there are some insurance carriers that may be starting to uh, think along those lines for CAR T cell therapy as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, uh, and, and they may be forming specific relationships with specific products as well. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Andrew Hantel. Um, given the intensity and specialized care needed, what access and equity issues have been seen in getting these treatments to patients? How will these be expanded to broader populations beyond places like Dana-Farber or to get these populations treated at places like Dana-Farber? Yeah, so I think, um, so one thing we didn't talk about is the fact that, yeah, obviously these uh, therapies are only administered in specialized and certified centers. We actually have to be federally accredited to be able to deliver these therapies as well. You, you need, I, you know, I see care, ICU care that, that can be an expert in this therapy. We you need neurologic care that can be an expert in this therapy. And so this can't be safely given um, at every community center um, or even uh, some access academic centers across the country. Um, so I think actually geographic localization is the biggest problem. I think we obviously in a, in a city like Boston, um, where we have four different hospitals that give CAR T cells uh, within, within you know, a, a 10 mile uh, square, a 10 square mile radius. Um, 
uh, you know, we're very lucky, but there are parts of the country where they're the closest CAR T cell uh, treatment center is, you know, 10, 10 hours away driving. Um, and patients have to, are mandated by the federal government to stay within two hours of the treating center for the first four weeks. So this is a big problem for people, right? They have to relocate, they have to, um, you know, find housing, they have to have family come with them and stay with them for 24 hours a day for that four week period. Um, and so the biggest limitation I think so far has been been geographic access. Um, but even within Boston, um, you know, I've been shocked by how, my, how, you know, we get referrals from lots of places, but Boston Medical Center, which serves our uh, most underserved populations, we see very few referrals for CAR T cells um, from Boston Medical Center. So there's still a socio socioeconomic access issue, even within Boston, where we have, you know, four different CAR T cell treatment centers. I'm wondering, um, in your experience, this is cost a major issue for patients and their own decision making. Uh, of course, this will vary on kind of how much you're expected to take up of the expense. But you just mentioned travel and all these other big expenses that families could be hit with. You know, is that a major factor, and does that come up in the decision making? Do you see that playing a big role in people's decision making about this? Yeah. So I think I think it's a fact. I think the biggest. So it's 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 a. So right now, um, CAR T cells are given to about a quarter of patients who, who would qualify in the United States. We are not treating as many patients as we should with CAR T cells. And some of it is referral bias. Um, you know, I think it's, it's the physicians in the community that have, who believe, these, uh, believe some myths about cost, about how hard it is to get insurance approval um, and things like that. Um, uh, and I would say, so it's not the patients themselves. By the time the patient comes to us, they understand, they, they, they feel confident that, uh, you know, we'll work to make sure insurance will pay for it and they won't get a big bill. Um, but 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 there's a ref, there's sort of a there, there's some there's sort some there's still some mythology mythology in the community about this from the provider standpoint and so some that it, that hinders referrals in the other factor I think when a patient gets to us is just sort of you know saying like I I can't possibly live in you know my I my we all have to work we all if we don't work we don't we can't keep our house I can't my me and my, my wife and I can't move to Boston for four weeks both of us be out of work stay in pay for a hotel even though we have you know we can do this in a subsidized way um and you know give up our livelihoods um you know I think it's 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 uh it's the way that that disruption impacts uh, their financial bottom lines that can, and, and the ability to have a caregiver 24 hours a day, seven days a week for those four weeks, that has been the most rate limiting thing, I think, for some of our patients. You know, Karen, right before we went on air live, uh, we were just chatting a little bit about how COVID may have affected, you know, hospitals in the, in the area in Boston and, and in your experience. And you said during the actual major part of the crisis, in your line of work, you didn't see a big difference. But maybe nowadays, you know, as, as the, the pandemic continues to linger on and people are, are um, removing themselves from some of their jobs and roles in the healthcare profession, you may be taking on an issue. So my question for you is this. Um, this is a very complicated therapy. Now, on the hospital or on the, the medical professional side of things, who all is involved in this therapy? Clearly, people like you, but like, can you kind of walk us through all the different role players that are that have to be involved in this kind of therapy? Yeah, absolutely. So, obviously, there are the the clinicians, the nurses, the nurse practitioners, and physician assistants, and the and the physicians um, who who meet the patient, who um, you know, who identify the patient, and who get the patient you know lined up for their therapy. Um, but uh, you know, the behind the scenes work. Um, so obviously, obviously, it's getting geared up to even start a CAR T cell program. Um, you know the all hospital administrators, both at Brigham and Women's and at Dana Farber, um, you know, were, were all hands on deck to make sure that we had the infrastructure in place that we could do this uh, in a safe way. I think that was the biggest concern as we were starting um, uh, starting this program, and so that meant that we were um, liaising with. Um, 
you know, quality groups, we were liaising with the ICU, we were liaising with the emergency room, um, with our pharmacists, because we have to be able to get some of these toxicity mitigating drugs to patients really, really quickly, um, with um, uh, both inpatient and outpatient nursing, uh, with uh, the, 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 our blood donation center, which is where the cells are collected, with our cell processing lab, which is where the cells come back and are, are thawed before the patient gets them. Um, with, uh, we have uh, a whole group that is only involved, their only job is for financial clearance uh, acquisition before a uh, patient can proceed with the therapy. Um, we have a, because this is a feder, this is a feder, we, we are able to deliver this therapy because we are feder federally accredited. We have to re-up that accreditation and show that we are uh, um, that we are auditing our program and maintaining quality assurance within the program, and so that that's a whole nother group. Um, uh, we are mandated to report our outcomes uh, through a uh, international registry, um, and so we have to have data, uh, and we have to have you know data personnel who can enter all of that data into these databases. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting uh, forgetting. Uh, people um, along the way. And then of course, this, that, that's all to support our commercial program, but we are a big research institution and we want to continue to grow this uh, across the Institute. And so we have clinical research coordinators, research nurses, um, uh, regulatory coordinators and uh, research managers all working with us to try to keep our research program alive and thriving. So um, it's a it's it's a village. It takes you know if I put a if I put a an org chart up if I could if I had a computer and I could put an org chart up you would see that it's you know we probably touch like a you know 100 to 200 uh, staff members just to be able to deliver these therapies. You know, I've seen in some of the literature people arguing that you could try to drive down the cost of the therapy by offering it as an outpatient um, kind of context. But what you just said seems to indicate that that's probably not realistic. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think the 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 cost issue. Um, so I think the the issue with whether doing this outpatient is cost effective has to do with your hospital's reimbursement mechanisms, um, and whether uh, so 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 for some centers uh, because of their their cost structure and and. Um, you know, once a patient is hospitalized, there's one lump sum that's delivered to the hospital for that hospitalization. And it's, you know, everything that happens to the patient during that time is encapsulated in that. And so you don't add on a $400,000 um, uh, cell product charge. It's, it's whatever they get reimbursed. And so in that case, if you could, if you could actually give the cells to the patient as an outpatient, you can bill for the cells themselves. Um, and if they stay as an outpatient for technically 72 hours and then get, get admitted, that admission is separate from that out charge. And so many centers that, that operate under that cost structure and that cost re that, that reimbursement structure, um, for them, an outpatient administration where patients can stay out of the hospital long enough uh, that they uh, that that the outpatient care and the inpatient care will be considered separate events um, would be cost effective. That's not how Dana Farber uh, is reimbursed, and so it's never been. Um, it's never been like the priority for doing this as an outpatient. We are starting to do this as an outpatient um, because we because patients want it. Um, some you know some patients want it. I should say some patients say I don't want to have anything to do with taking care of myself when I'm at home. Put me in the hospital. Let someone else do it. But some patients want it. Um, and because as products get safer and safer, this is going to become a reality that these are going to be able to be outpatient. And we we just want to continue to be at the cutting edge. But it's not. Uh, it's not a cost issue um, uh, for us. Um, I think the um, the one thing that I think could really drive down cost is um, on-site manufacturing. So most of these centers that give CAR T cells actually have cell processing labs that have the capability of making, you know, Me Too CD19 cars. Um, and if we could make them in-house, they would be significantly less expensive. Um, the pro there are two problems with it. 
um, one is that there's no regulatory path, right? So you, you these trials to to get the FDA to these trials to generate data for the FDA to review are incredibly expensive, um, and so and if I have to do that at Dana Farber and someone else has to do that at Mass General, and then we're just spending a, an inordinate amount of money to do the same work. Um, so I think this is definitely something that CMS and the FDA are looking at in terms of trying to figure out a path to regulatory approval for homegrown cars. But if, if, you know, if you turn to the three big companies that have CD19 cars right now and say, well, we're just, you know, you did all the work, but we're just going to start making them at Dana Farber instead, then we're not going to buy them from you. That loses their um, both incentive as well as their bottom that reduces their bottom line to be able to invest in future R and D, and we can't we can't move this field forward without them. So it's it's you know there's a push and pull as with everything in medicine, um, but we uh, you know I think that we have to sort of meet someplace in the middle, and maybe it starts with drug pricing, but um, uh, making it you know taking the pressure off to do them at home <laughs> and just by charging less. Um, but, you know, it's a complicated, it's a complicated world. <laughs> so my neighbor decided that now would be a good time to mow his lawn. So it's getting a little noisy here on my end. Uh, so I hope you can hear me, but welcome to the world of live webinars. Um, another question has come in. This is from Kristen Van Vliet. She's at MIT. Hi, Kristen. Um, so I'll always paraphrase her question. Do you think that there are opportunities to reduce the total cost by improvements to the car T cell product manufacturing, that end of things. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not a pharmaceutical, I'm not a biotech company and I don't actually know sort of, I don't know, I, the, my, my impression has always been that um, the cost of these products is not actually the, it's not driven by profit. It, it, it really does take a lot of money to, to make these products. Also, you have to realize that these companies are getting, you know, you know, cells from institutions, probably, you know, 30 to 50 cells, you know, cell products a week. And they have to make sure that they um, uh, are giving back the, the same patient cells, right? So there's a lot that goes into, you know, sort of the quality assurance aspect of, of this um, that is expensive. Um, I think, I, the, but the bottom line is all, you know, that, that can all be streamlined if, if we could do the cell processing in-house. So I think it's, it, you know, yes, obviously the, these companies, if they could come up with sort of more streamlined ways for manufacturing, but I think there are some built-in costs there that are just for patient safety. Um, but, but if we did it within the halls of our own institution where we, you know, we literally take the cells from the patient's bed to, you know, three, three floors up and deliver them to the lab and they go right into manufacturing, um, that, that's going to be a lot cheaper. Um, but it goes with the downsides that I or it's it both right now is not feasible from a regulatory perspective and then also uh does sort of cut cut the incentive for research and development within the field i think okay i've got one last question for you this is also from rigo um curious you know the the, the prospect of using off the shelf or donor car t cell donor t cells for car t cell therapy um number one do you think that would help reduce the cost? My guess is not from what you just said, but also just in general, you know, what are the prospects of this? Is it looking very promising to use donor cells? Yeah. So let's talk about donor cells a little bit. Yeah, so, um, so th there is one way that it can reduce the cost, which is that they can make, you can make like a hundred products from one phoresis. So, so, you know, um, I do think it can, and, and of course, in, in these instances, you're not worried about sort of a uh, chain of custody, like, you know, making sure that the same, the patient gets their own cells back. So there are, you do lose the sort of, like, you lose some of the, 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 the requirements that are expensive for autologous CAR T cells. Um, so I do think it could drive it down. Um, the, my biggest concern about these allogeneic CARs is, is persistence of the CAR T cells themselves. That, that, you know, I think the patient, the patient's own immune system, even though you have tried to lymphode, you know, lymphodeplete them or condition them so that their immune system is 
less robust, um, uh, you know, does seem to come back and get rid of these car these donor CAR T cells. And if they do it too soon, if it does it too soon before the tumor is eradicated, then then there's going to be a risk of relapse. Um, so we don't have long term data yet to see that these are. Um, uh, are going to be as durable um, in terms of response um, because there's extra gene editing involved in these uh, donor T cells. Um, you know, there's theoretically a concern that the, there could be, um, you know, more lo long-term issues down the road because of you know issues we've seen with gene editing. And I don't know if there there has there was a the, um, one of the most furthest along trials of allocar T cells uh, was actually just halted by the FDA um, uh, because of an outcome where um, a patient had a complication that was probably not related to the gene editing. But when they went and did the bone marrow biopsy, they found that the CAR T cells themselves had had uh, a genetic translocation of one of the, that was not present in the healthy donor. So that it raised the question of whether these, these you know, the complexity of the gene editing that's happening in these allogeneic CAR T cells uh, may have downstream repercussions, you know, for the patient. Um, down the line. So oh, I, yeah. I know I didn't really answer the question. I, I think I'm, uh, you know, I, I think they, they serve a role. I don't think they're going to replace autologous CAR T cells. Well, with that, thank you so much for your presentation. I learned a ton. I'm sure our audience did as well. So I really thank you for joining us today, Karen. I also want to thank Ashley Troutman and Helen Stefanidis uh, for their logistical support for this series. Um, so that concludes today's session. session. I invite you to come back on November 19th to hear about what we can learn from the ACE2 cellular receptor by Joseph Henninger. Apparently we can learn a lot. So I'm looking forward to that session next month. And with that, I'm gonna to conclude today's um, talk. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time. Thank you. And my computer is back up, so I will join your other Zoom for, through my computer and you can see me, okay? Thank you. All right, I'm sorry about this. <laughs> I'll be I'll be back. <laughs>